on this edition of Exposé. Reporters at the Washington Post follow the money. I said, I'm going to meet you at this hotel, and I'm going to I'm going to be there on this day. Please meet me. Funding for Exposé has been provided by On November 25, 2002, Congress established the Department of Homeland Security. That same day, it created billions of dollars in government spending. That money soon flowed into the hands of private corporations charged with creating systems and technology to make the country safer. A newspaper famed for its investigative reporting has been following that money, The Washington Post. We're off the main newsroom in the investigative staff uh, offices. I like to call this the Osama bin Laden cave because very few people know where we are. We have about between 12 to 15 full-time investigative reporters, and we also have a full-time uh, researcher, Alice Kreitz. It's cramped. That's what it feels very cramped, it, and, and none of them want to give up any of their boxes, and so they've walled themselves in with some boxes. And you know, it's a complete fire hazard. That is the mystique of the investigative unit. It's very glamorous. We're surrounded by lots and lots of boxes and piles of paper. About two years ago, my editor uh, said that he had received uh, a phone call from Bob Woodward, and uh, Bob had gotten a tip from a source of his. And the information basically was that uh, the Department of Homeland Security was claiming that it had put in place a number of systems to prevent another terrorist attack and that they had made the nation safer when in fact these systems were deeply flawed. Our goal was to look at the spending on the major systems of Homeland Security, the bomb detectors at the airports, the hiring of the screeners. We had to, to penetrate the secret world of contracting where the, the inside audit information is held almost like a state secret. The Post put two veteran reporters on the story, Scott Hyam and Robert O'Hara, Jr. Scott has done the Abu Ghraib investigation. He won a Pulitzer Prize for an investigation on the deaths of children under the care of the D.C. government. Robert wrote a highly acclaimed book about privacy. So they're two very strong investigative talents, and knowing that two uh, good reporters are better than one, we just decided to put them together. Despite their combined 40 years of reporting experience, Hyam and O'Hara quickly learned how much they didn't know about the world of government contracts. Scott and I went to a graduate program to study contracting. It's so arcane uh, that to even have a chance in writing about this stuff, you have to do something like that. How are you going to transition from... O'Hara and Hyam attended a graduate-level class in which government workers are trained to oversee federal contracts. There, the reporters learned how the system should work. Contracts should be competitively bid upon with clearly defined deadlines and costs. Once awarded, they should be closely monitored by properly trained federal contracting officials. I mean, we really learned a lot about how contracting works. What are the red flags? Uh, what are the signs that that uh, companies are trying to take advantage of contracts. We were initially kind of concerned at the graduate school as to why we had Washington Post reporters in the class. And Kent Goodger is, is uh, you know, he's just a rock solid guy. You know, he understands contracting probably better than most people in this town. He's been doing it for 35 years. That's IT. Right, which includes ADB hardware, software, and services. He was like our Sherpa, you know, who was like dragging us up the mountain. I'd like to just get your impression on something. These young guys came out of school. And helping us to understand some of the information that we were starting to get from other sources. 
you know, is, is this important? Why is it important? What are we missing here? What I was struck by this investigation was that even though it's billions of dollars of taxpayer money, how much of this stuff operates in secret uh, and how difficult it is to get any information about a big government contract. They make it very hard for you to follow the money in Homeland Security. A federal contract to hire passenger screeners for the Transportation Security Administration, the TSA, caught the reporter's eyes when they learned it had been audited by an independent federal agency. There is a agency in town called the Defense Contract Audit Agency. They are probably the gold standard of auditors in, in Washington, D.C. And we had heard that they had looked at this TSA contract for passenger screeners, and they had found numerous problems. That was like really the holy grail, sitting down there in the bowels of government. There were a detailed accounting of problems with these Homeland Security contracts that were not public documents. So we, d we set it as our mission to get our hands on those. I got an anonymous call uh, from somebody who said, this audit is really powerful, and you're never going to get it. The government is not going to give it to you, because it is so embarrassing to the government about how $700 million of taxpayers' money was misspent and abused, and in some cases, there was fraud involved. Hyam and O'Hara had to get a copy of the secret TSA audit. To obtain documents from the U.S. government, reporters often make official requests under the Freedom of Information Act, FOIA. The request was denied. It happens frequently during their ongoing investigation. Okay. And so they're going to deny all the other letters on the same basis? Yeah. But, I mean, if you're going to claim that every, every piece of correspondence that you get from a particular congressman is interagency, is that your position? Well, okay. Well, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't know if you are, but, yeah. All right, well, um, send me the letter. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye. So they're, they're denying our FOIA. I would argue that our government has become uh, almost obsessed with secrecy. And frankly, I don't think it's necessarily just for national security. I think it's an issue of control. I think uh, from the White House down, uh, they are trying to exercise a powerful hand. And one of the main ways they do that is to block uh, guys like me and Scott out from the process of doing our jobs. Official Washington had stonewalled them on the TSA audit, so Hyam and O'Hara pursued the source of the original anonymous phone call. Using clues from that conversation, Hyam was able to deduce the tipster's identity. I contacted this person and said, it's really important that we have this audit. And this person did not want to give it to me, was very, very nervous. And over the course of many conversations, this person slowly started to reveal details that were contained in the audit. Ultimately, I said, I'm going to meet you at this hotel, and I'm going to, I'm going to be there on this day. Please meet me. And I didn't know if this person was going to meet me or not, but the person did meet me. Hiam got what he came for. But yeah, when we got this, I mean, we had no idea, you know, how good this document was going to be. Um, you know, um, from talking to the source, we had a pretty good sense that it was going to be a good document, but you never know until you get it in your hands. It was basically a holy document, because you start to read it and you say, holy look at this page after page of revelation about how the taxpayer's money was completely misspent and completely just wasted. This became a real breakthrough uh, in the investigation because it provided us with a platform and a roadmap of where to go, names of sources, contacts, places where things uh, happened, how much money was spent specifically. The reporters had the goods to start publishing articles demonstrating massive waste and abuse in Homeland Security contracting. The audit showed how the global conglomerate Pearson, contracted to hire TSA security personnel, had spent over $700 million on the project, more than seven times the original budget. This was due in part to the federal government's changing the original plans for hiring events. 
Instead of holding job fairs at cost-effective hiring centers, the TSA now instructed Pearson to hold events at luxury hotels like the Waldorf Astoria and Millennium in New York City. And one of Pearson's subcontractors in the screener's deal came under close scrutiny in the audit. There were some details, very intriguing details, about a company that seemed to come out of nowhere called Eclipse. And references to Eclipse's founder, a woman named Sunny Sims. Even the name was kind of intriguing. She was given this contract with a, almost no background check on who she was, what this company did, and whether or not they could fulfill the mandate that uh, you know she was being given. And Robert went out to San Diego to basically find Sunny Sims. I'm zipping around San Diego, and I went to this address that was related to the company. It was a post office box. And I went to where the company was originally incorporated, and it was her apartment. And then I went to her new home address, and I wound my way up this small mountain. And at the top was this just gorgeous sort of Frank Lloyd Wright kind of house with giant palm trees out front and a, a lawn crew, a maintenance crew, cutting the grass. And I realized that that house had been paid for with, in effect, the profits from a, uh, uh, a project that was uh, almost completely out of control. She never talked to us, but we talked to a lot of her employees who said money was just flying around, it was going out the window, there were cash advances that were unaccounted for, $5,000 at a time, people were just cashing checks. Um, they were running up telephone bills, they were staying in really nice hotels, resorts all around the country uh, to hire people to become passenger screeners. After the project was over, this woman, this remarkable character, in effect retired and decided to work as a, a lay minister for a church uh, near her home. She paid herself a $5 million salary for nine months worth of work. She gave herself a $200,000 pension. And it was nice work if you can get it. was by no means all about Sonny Sims. I mean, the number two at Homeland Security, Michael Jackson, uh, we found approved more than $300 million in spending on this initiative without any paperwork. Uh, we had, you know, scores of pages of uh, examples of potential fraud and certainly waste and abuses. And all along, we were left with the question, who approved this in the government? And people kept saying, oh, it's this person. And then that person would say, oh, it's this person. And eventually they said, Michael Jackson approved this. And by this time, he's the number two at Homeland Security. I mean, we wanted to ask him one key question, and that is, you know, who made the decision that changed the scope of this contract to cost taxpayers more than $300 million? And so we called him up, and he said, you know, come on over, and we'll talk about it. What shocked us, though, really, was that they invited us to go to the Department of Homeland Security at kind of a crazy time. Right. Katrina had just hit the Gulf Coast of the United States, and they had asked us to come over that Monday evening, uh, the day after the hurricane uh, made landfall. That morning, all hell broke loose in New Orleans. It was surreal. We were sitting in a conference room, not unlike this one, fully expecting uh, Michael Jackson's aide to come out and say, you know, I'm really sorry, guys, but, you know, Katrina is just wreaking havoc. The levees have broken down in New Orleans. We're going to have to put this interview off. And Robert and I would have totally understood. So he comes into the room. He brings that sort of um, very crisp, officious quality to the table and immediately launches into cut us some slack because, uh, yes, we did not keep the kinds of records we were supposed to. Yes, this contract ballooned, you know, by hundreds of millions of dollars but we need a pass because we were trying to do the right thing. It, got, it felt like it got very close to be patriots and go with the flow. The Post would report that Jackson and his agency had no paperwork documenting the decision to authorize over $300 million in additional spending on the TSA screeners contract. Jackson told the paper, quote, Honestly, I have no memory of it. For their part, neither Pearson nor its subcontractor, Eclipse, admitted wrongdoing. Pearson said responsibility for the increase in the contract lay with the TSA. As the reporters dug deeper, they learned that the enormous task of overseeing federal contracts was being handled by very few contracting officers. One example, they reported that only 61 employees were monitoring $4 billion worth of TSA contracts. 
An inspector general's report said up to 628 are needed. The decline in federal contracting oversight, they learned, along with the elimination of some, though not all, regulations, dates back to the Clinton administration. There's this perfect storm that's been created where there is less oversight, there are fewer regulations, and then 9-11 hits and there's all this money that's available and it starts flowing. It's amazing how often we see the Capitol or the Library of Congress or the Supreme Court. You don't really give much time to the big thoughts about the Constitution and what the government's about. You're just so focused on getting the story. But sometimes when you start to realize just how much money's been wasted or the tricks that they're playing or the games that they're playing with these contracts, sometimes that's when you start sort of thinking about uh, the outrage and the lack of accountability and some of the basic principles that, you know, supposedly, supposedly the country is founded on. To penetrate the secret world of contracting, the reporters often need to convince reluctant sources to talk. If I wanted to talk, talk to somebody about the Washington Post and what was going on at the Washington Post, mm -hmm. I wouldn't do it while I was at the Washington Post. You know what I mean? So we like to try to get people out into a restaurant, into a bar, their homes where they feel very comfortable, where there's nobody around. They can talk without fear of anybody else seeing, overhearing. There's no phone record. There's no nothing. I think knocking on doors is one of the, uh, the best ways of uh, finding out information and cultivating people. A couple of times we've had, it, it, we've had people say, oh no, I, I don't need a subscription to the Washington Post. A lot of the sources that we've dealt with I would characterize as, as being very brave uh, and, uh, and kind of heroes for, for the taxpayers. On their way to meet an important source in their continuing investigation, Hyam and O'Hara find themselves at an unusual landmark. Parking garage where yes, Bob Woodward used mm -hmm. to be. Mm -hmm. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in Roslyn, Virginia, which is right across the river from Washington, D.C., and just by happenstance, we're meeting somebody here, but this happens to be the garage uh, where Bob Woodward used to meet his source, uh, Deep Throat. Uh, I constantly invoke uh, Bob and Carl's name when people are reluctant to talk to us, and, uh, and they're in very sensitive positions, and I say, look, you know, we kept the identity of Deep Throat secret for 30 years. We can protect you. And, uh, you know, we'll go to jail to, to protect you, and I'll stay in jail, and I'll never give your name up. And I'm really serious about that. It's, it's, a, it's a promise that we make and that we keep no matter what. A centerpiece of the Department of Homeland Security's plan to make the nation safe is a $10 billion high-tech system designed to track foreign visitors to the United States. It's called the U.S. Visit Program. Using biometrics, U.S. Visit enhances security while facilitating legitimate travel and trade. First, your two index fingers will be scanned by a special inkless digital scanner. And second, a digital photograph will be taken. The contract for U.S. Visit was awarded to another global conglomerate, Accenture. Hyam and O'Hara learned the contract was awarded in a way that could cost the government billions in overruns. Searching for more information, the reporters found someone with a unique insider perspective, Angela Stiles, President Bush's top procurement official from 2001 till 2003. Oh, I was suspicious. <laughs> I think I was suspicious when I met Scott and Robert. I mean, you know, I'm a very conservative Republican, and it's the Washington Post. And, um, you know, there's always been kind of this historic back and forth between Republicans and the Washington Post, and the, I think the press and, and Republicans. Stiles recalls the time when the U.S. visit contract was awarded. The government at the time, it was the Department of Justice, went out with a solicitation that just broadly said, protect us from terrorists, is pretty much what it said. And, you know, a company, Accenture, came forward and said, yes, we can, for $10 billion. And if you walk through customs right now, you will see these little kiosks turned around that said U.S. visit on it. You know, money was spent, a lot of money was spent for a system that didn't work. DHS told the Post it does work. But Hyam at O'Hara found several problems with the U.S. visit program. One flaw, its two-fingerprint system isn't fully compatible with the Justice Department's state-of-the-art 10-fingerprint database. 
Experts told the reporters this means a known terrorist could slip through. People were afraid to talk about it before. People didn't want to say the system wasn't working. You don't want to be six years into administration and start saying, oh, the system isn't working because at that point it's your fault. The stories about cost overruns and scant oversight just kept coming. Example, a Unisys contract to network airport security computers has already doubled and may triple its original estimate of a billion dollars. This is in part due, allege auditors, to Unisys overbilling more than 171,000 hours of labor done by lower level employees at higher than justifiable rates. Unisys denies wrongdoing. The auditor asked the DHS Inspector General to investigate. It's a gold rush. It is. It's a modern day gold rush. It's a free for all. It's like being in a, in a, in a modern day mining town and there are, there are not a lot of rules and people are just uh, seeing their opportunities. Well, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of rules. There's a lot of rules, but people are not paying attention to them. We started looking at how politics intersect with Homeland Security contracting. And one of the people that we decided to focus on is a congressman named Hal Rogers from Kentucky. Very, very powerful chairman of the Appropriations Committee. And he basically decides what gets funded and what doesn't get funded. Government contractors, Homeland Security contractors, were donating uh, tens of thousands of dollars to his political action committee and even some of them started moving into his district in, you know, Appalachia. Uh, in one case, a company said it was moving there for the workforce. In other cases, they uh, claimed they wanted to be near a source of power, which I thought was pretty honest. Privately, government bureaucrats and corporate bureaucrats tell us they're afraid of them, and they want to keep them happy. IM and O'Hara's reporting explored donations from executives of a startup company called Reveal to Hal Rogers Political Action Fund and Rogers championing Reveal's contracting bid. Robert put together a really big link chart for Hal Rogers because it was so many relationships that he had. So trying to that visually, you know, to visualize those relationships, suddenly you start to see things that you normally wouldn't see. You start to see patterns. Right here, you've got Hal Rogers at the center of this chart that we did. And all these rays represent relationships to uh, government contractors. A fellow named Clay Parker Davis, the president and the founder of the uh, bank that Hal Rogers is an owner and director of. Hal Pack is his pack. Well, Clay Parker Davis is the treasurer that Hal Pack, in turn, keeps its money in Citizens Bank. Here's the lobbyist that was hired by Reveal, which moved into his district, gave $122,000 to Hal Pack, and eventually they got a $463 million contract for um, baggage screening explosive detection systems. They gave an enormous amount of money to Hal Rogers. They told Hal Rogers that they would move part of their manufacturing into his district, and lo and behold, this company got the contract. The Post's reporting has led to congressional hearings in Washington and a congressional report on Homeland Security contracting. The report describes a pattern of reckless spending, poor planning, and ineffective oversight that is wasting taxpayers' dollars and undermining our homeland security. The arcane issues of contracting and spending government money is the kind of thing that Congress is supposed to know a lot about. Instead, we had to learn it from two very courageous reporters who did this work for us. We're following the money and letting people know what's happening with their hard-earned cash. It's been almost three years since The Post started reporting the story. So far, no heads have rolled. They're not really holding these companies accountable. Nobody's gone to jail. Um, there haven't even been any civil penalties assessed against any of these corporations. Congressman Hal Rogers told The Post that he is working in the interests of the nation and his district. The Post wrote that he dismissed any suggestion that campaign money could sway his policy making. Robert O'Hara and Scott Hyam have continued to scrutinize government contracting, recently investigating a little-known but powerful agency, the U.S. General Services Administration. Their reporting has raised questions about the organization's chief, Loretta Doan, who, to name two allegations, attempted to give a no-bid contract to a friend. 
and encouraged use of GSA resources to benefit Republican candidates in the next elections. Doan denied wrongdoing. Congress held hearings. So when you, as the head of the agency, suggest how can we help our candidates, and they've seen this slide, can you understand how reasonable people could conclude that those political appointees may be feeling pressure to do something to help these candidates? No, I'm not engaged in partisan political activities, and I haven't directed anyone to do anything. In May 2007, the U.S. Office of Special Counsel concluded that Doan had broken the law by supporting partisan politics on the job. A month later, the Post reported that the special counsel urged President Bush to discipline her to the fullest extent. Expose has been provided by